One of the most common barbs thrown against religious folk is aimed at prayer. Prayer is a waste of time. Prayer doesn't do anything. Prayer is superstitious. And prayer keeps us from doing things that actually make a difference. And it can be hard to argue with this, especially when we hear glib recommendations in the face of natural disaster or human tragedy. And for me, it's even worse when prayer is recommended as a way to make us more submissive to systems of oppression. When we're asked to be patient, to pray a little, and hope things will turn out OK. As an example, I have no patience or interest in notions like those espoused by one a minister to pray that a God will grant Donald Trump wisdom out of the air because, in her words, <laughs> as Christians, we should pray that our elected officials will seek God and his will. God alone can change the heart of the king if the people of God would seek his will and not their own. Leaving off my objections to that statement, I especially object to this kind of thinking when it's part of a resignation to the way things are, such as when the pastor went on to write that our current president has been chosen by the people and by the divine will of God. Now let us honor God by honoring our current president as we render to God what God sees fit to do in America. So I do believe people, even a person like Donald Trump, can have a change of heart. I don't believe it comes through wishful thinking, but through the hard work of social change, through communities organizing, resisting, and embodying a better, more whole, and more peaceful and just way of living with one another. When it comes to injustice, we need to be saying no, not just saying our prayers. So I'm sympathetic with the criticisms. However, I'm also sometimes frustrated with them because I think we miss an opportunity to understand why humans pray and what happens when we pray. Most of these attacks are really directed against supernaturalism in general and not prayer itself. From a sociological perspective, even the frustrating requests can become much more interesting, although they might also become more disturbing. Prayer says a lot about the people who are praying. It's a very human thing, reflecting our deepest desires, our deepest insecurities, our deepest frustrations, fears, and even aspirations. I suspect this is why many people are pretty hesitant to pray in public. We understand at some level that we're revealing more than we might be ready to share. I myself have had some pretty strange lessons in the course of my religious journey, some laughable, some embarrassing, and some painful. In my experience growing up in the Southern Baptist Church, prayer was mainly sentimental. Prayer requests for healing and help were very common, but they were mainly used to elicit sympathy and support from one another. We were expected to say that we believed our prayers would be answered with divine actions like healing, but I don't remember anyone really having a sense that this would be the case unless it involved the collection of money. God's ways were inscrutable. <laughs> inscrutable, beyond our understanding and even our expectation. Prayer requests also provided a convenient and pious cover for one of our time-honored and favorite pastimes, which was gossip. All this changed when, as a teenager, I became increasingly involved in summer Bible camps and local youth meetings that my elders somehow thought were a good idea. In particular, I became immersed in a local charismatic church that turned out to be spiritually abusive and dangerous, <clears throat> although that wasn't apparent at the beginning when I started going. We were taught, for example, that taking any kind of medicine or seeing a doctor was blasphemous and that God would reward our faith if we took risks to be faithful to that God. Eventually, the limitations of those teachings became painfully apparent First, one of the youth minister's children died during childbirth because of refusal to get medical care. And a year later or so, another child was barely rescued when the mother sought medical care for a life-threatening condition for the child. The mother was considered to be in sin. The couple were divorced. Eventually, the minister moved away to start again. Did I stress enough that teachings on prayer can be abusive and dangerous? Gratefully, I came to a little closer uh, to a more stable and helpful understanding of prayer during my freshman year of college. 
especially regarding prayers for healing, that carried me through until I could form a more mature and rational approach. The crucible for that process of understanding was the final illness and death of my maternal grandmother. A couple of evenings a week and each weekend, I would return to my parents' house and spend hours sitting with and praying for my grandmother, who had moved into my old bedroom when she required hospice care. Over several months, my prayers became markedly different, not focusing on changing some God's mind or giving instructions for what should be done and to whom, and not confronting illness as a demonic attack or even confronting death as an enemy. In my readings, I'd picked up on the teaching that no prayer goes unanswered when the one who prays is changed. Praying for my grandmother opened my heart, both to the terrible pain and suffering in the world and to the compassion, empathy, and love that could fill it. In sharp contrast to either sentiment or miracle, I began experiencing prayer as the embodiment of love. I found that the answers to my prayers were demonstrated in the expressions of care we shared together, in planting flowers and installing a, a bird bath outside the window, in quietly sitting while finger picking the familiar hymns, hymns on the guitar, in hearing confessions and fears and questions about death and prayerful acceptance and love, in cooking whatever meal sounded best at the moment, whether it would be eaten or not, and sharing stories and memories of life. My grandmother died, and our prayers couldn't change that painful journey, but I began to learn how to pray, quite accidentally, through that sharing of love, life, and death together. In hindsight, it was probably then that I began approaching my spiritual practice more like a Quaker, though I did not have the community or language at the time. But I can recognize, growing from that part of my life, the wisdom expressed by David Johnson that we read in our wisdom lesson. A Quaker prayer life arises from a life of continuing daily attentiveness. The difficulties we experience in inward prayer are preparations for our outward lives. Each time we return to the center in prayer, we're modeling how to live our lives. These days, I still set aside time to pray, usually a fair bit each morning and a briefer time before bed. It mainly looks like meditation. I sit on a cushion and bring my attention to my breath or to a situation or relationship with kindness and curiosity. I come into a deeper awareness of how each moment is an unfolding of all the causes and conditions that have come before it. I come into a deeper understanding of how all conditions arise and cease. I get a glimpse into my own reactivity and how that reactivity arises out of years of social and psychological conditioning, buried and usually unnoticed. And over time, insight, patience, goodwill, generosity, and if I'm fortunate, wisdom begins to grow. Following the Quaker tradition, I make frequent uses of uh, vices and queries. Following the Franciscan tradition, I can use liturgical prayers from time to time. I sometimes light candles and incense because I like that stuff. And you may even catch me chanting Christian, Buddhist, or humanist texts. But the heart of my prayer life is keeping silence. It was in this silence that I discovered that prayer could be a way to honestly confront my attitudes, assumptions, and habits. Prayer could make a space to feel the frustration, rage, grief, or confusion without being dragged around by them. Through prayer and meditation, I could become familiar with how those emotions and their often torturous thoughts would come and go, what triggered them, what soothed them, and what risks they raised, and what wisdom they offered. Similarly, I could recognize and feel more at home with joy, kindness, wisdom, and gratitude. I could begin to influence my automatic reactions through a kind, persistent practice of meditation. And during the rest of the day, I began to notice that I had more empathy for myself and others, more patience, more flexibility around those reactions, more creativity. When I did have strong reactions to my experiences, I also had more space in which to respond, more ability to choose what I wanted to do. To remember Johnson's words, I found that the difficulties we experience in inward prayer are preparation for our outward lives. Each time we return to the center in prayer, we're modeling how to live our lives. 
The wisdom of this approach is also why I'm not too upset when someone mocks and laughs at the idea of prayer. In fact, I think it has its place. It helps keep me honest because I truly don't want to substitute sentiment for action. I don't want to cover up suffering with piety or delusion. I want my prayer life to be a model for how I go through the day with curiosity, openness, kindness, gratitude, and a compassionate and passionate commitment to social justice and equality and community. Amen. And this is why I think it can be helpful if we look at what is actually happening when, we, when people pray, what's happening both psychologically and sociologically, both within us and between us. Instead of focusing on whether prayer brings about supernatural results, which is a pretty irrelevant question for me, we can ask, can we uncover any of the functions prayer might play? Can we uncover any wisdom from the practice of prayer that can help to us to work together for social change in the direction of social justice, either as a caution or as a model? As it turns out, I think it's a pretty easy exercise to get a sense of the very human functions that prayer can play for good or for ill. Some of the common ones that popped into my head included to say thank you, to express deep emotions like outrage, grief, or joy, to cope with powerlessness, fear, frustration, or uncertainty, to identify our aspirations or our needs, to practice and rehearse relationship skills, to demonstrate group belonging, to influence our attitudes and perceptions, or to calm ourselves and even experience feelings of transcendence and bliss. One of the more interesting lines of inquiry in the last few years, to me, has taken a similar approach with the conclusion that prayer does indeed change things. But what it changes might come as a surprise to those who tend to think about prayer only in supernatural terms. For example, in 2010, Florida State University psychologist Nathaniel Lambert and his colleagues tested the relationship between prayer and forgiveness. They had two groups. One uh, had a particular prayer to pray. They, they prayed a single prayer for the romantic partner and for that romantic partner's well-being. And the other group of participants simply described their partner into a recorder. Through this research, they discovered that those who had prayed for their partner harbored fewer vengeful thoughts and emotions. They were ready to forgive and move on. In other words, prayer changed the person who prayed. The study did not try to measure change in the, in the one that was prayed for. Prayer changed that person's thinking, their feelings, and their actions. They were less likely to be vengeful, in turn creating conditions for changing that relationship with the other person. The researchers offered this hypothesis on why prayer worked that way. They said, most of the time, couples profess and believe in shared goals. But when they hit a rough patch, they often switch to adversarial goals like retribution and resentment. These adversarial goals shift cognitive focus to the self, and it can be tough to shake that self-focus. Prayer appears to shift attention from the self back to others, which allows the resentments to fade. Research has also been done on the impacts of Buddhist loving kindness or metta meditation on the brain. Fredrickson's report on in hope, open hearts build lives, concluded that the participants' positive emotions tripled during the brief time of that study. Uh, she reported, rather than becoming bored with or jaded to the effects of meditation, our participants seemed to be building a dependable skill for self-generating positive emotions again and again. These findings are especially noteworthy given that most of our participants were novice meditators and our meditation workshop lasted only seven weeks. Individuals began a mind training practice that increased their positive emotions and in turn, their personal resources and well-being. When people open their hearts to positive emotions, they seed their own growth in ways that transform them for the better. Similarly, a group of researchers documented how loving kindness meditation increases social connectedness. They discovered that even a brief seven minute exercise in cultivating positive regard was sufficient to induce small to moderate changes, an especially important resource in a time of rising societal isolation and distrust. This kind of meditation may be especially helpful for naturalists, agnostics, humanists, non-theists, post-theists, trans-theists, atheists, and others who may not want to use the language or rituals associated with theistic or supernatural forms of prayer. 
Since metta, this loving kindness, is a quality to be cultivated and doesn't require addressing any supernatural being. But metta is also appropriate for people in religious traditions. It's a very simple practice that many will recognize as compatible with whatever prayer life they have, or that skeptics can practice without any religious convictions at all. And for me, metta is a wonderful practice that helps bring prayer and meditation into my daily life, how I relate to others, to those who suffer injustice and those who inflict injustice, to the very earth, earth itself, my prayers are deeply connected with how I live, how I embody those prayers. Being centered in love after returning and resting in this attention, I can go back into the world with an equanimity and strength to pay attention to the deep suffering, to the deep wounds, to the deep needs around us. I can go back into the world with a heart overflowing with kindness, compassion, and joy. As Lawrence Freeman, a Benedictine monk and director of the World Community for Christian Meditation has taught, meditation, we soon come to realize, is a way of love because it is a way of attention. But there's a further consideration for me. That is, how do we build a bridge from prayer and meditation as personal practices that bear the fruit of love, kindness, and wisdom to communities of faith that bear the fruit of justice and peace? One of today's lectionary readings, if we had read it, contains an iconic verse about prayer. In this memory of the early church, Acts 2.42 notes that the community of faith devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Whatever we think about the prayers of those followers of Jesus described in the book of Acts, we cannot say that their prayers made them passive, apolitical, or ineffective. In fact, this was a community that had all things in common, a community that was so committed to social justice and equality that they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. They had glad and generous hearts, and it should be emphasized, they weren't exceptions. These weren't the unusual idealists who stood apart from the crowd. The book of Acts goes out of its way to say that this was everybody, all who believed. This was the community that would insist, as the book of James has it, that religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress. Practices such as prayer connected that community to what was best in their cultural memory, to have regard for the most vulnerable, to show respect and care to one another, and to do so on the basis of radical equality. In this description, I'm reminded again of James Cone's wisdom. In situations where we face systems of oppression, which is a pretty fair description of most of the world for most of the last maybe 10,000 years, we have only two alternatives. One, to accept the oppressor's value system and way of looking at the, uh, at the world and thus be contented with the place set for them by others, or two, to find a completely new way of looking at reality that enables us to fight against oppression. For me, prayer can be one of those paths toward looking at reality in a way that empowers us to fight against oppression, to continue in faithfulness even when we might otherwise succumb to discouragement and despair, by cultivating a relationship with our daily experiences that is oriented around grace, oriented around honesty that is also wise and kind, we have an alternative to acquiescing to the way things are. In the place of prayer, there is a refuge for justice and mercy. There can be a refuge where we can find healing, courage, and grace to sustain us. Prayer, meditation, sharing hospitality, sharing teachings, and other spiritual practices, the kind of things that make up uh, any given Sunday here at our, at our place of, of meeting, can not only be community experiences, they can also be community expressions, a community's embodiment of that fight against oppression. By participating in, a, in community, we engage in practices that shape our perceptions, that influence our emotional and interpretive reactions, that give us opportunities to act on our convictions. From a psychosocial point of view, this is what that description in Acts 2 was all about. But there are challenges. As we can see both from the long history of humanity and the recent history of the religious right, prayer can be used to bring out the worst in us to justify hatred and discrimination and oppression. 
For those who have been involved in coercive and ab abusive religious groups, shedding all of those religious and spiritual practices can be cathartic and healthy. For those who have never been involved, those practices often look at best unnecessary. For those who are oriented around a supernatural understanding of faith, the practices can degenerate into sentiment, demands for miracles or similar pitfalls. And as a progressive faith community emerging in this mix, we face the challenge of how to knit ourselves together, how to cultivate community that centers around praxis, around the changes we agree are necessary for humans to live together in a just, peaceful, whole way. If we're going to make use of spiritual practices and spiritual community, I think we could make use of a sociology of prayer. I've had a very modest goal this morning. I haven't tried to define prayer or say whether one needs to pray to something or someone. I haven't tried to categorize all the different ways we can pray from liturgical to silent, from giving thanks to making requests. And I've only dipped into the research without trying to argue that you should or shouldn't pray. My modest goal is simply to encourage us to explore all the resources that are available to us because this world is both beautiful and terrible. Humanity is both beautiful and terrible. The line between the two is very fine sometimes, between the sublime and the brutal, and the burden can sometimes feel overwhelming. It's joy that cannot be contained. It's sorrow that cannot be contained. There's only room in my small heart if I make the room. So I try to make it my practice to make the room, to take the bounds of this small life of mine and make them boundless, my heart and mind wide open to both the suffering and to the exuberant joy of living. I read and sing and walk and plant wildflowers. Paying attention, I learn how to love. I began this talk by noting that prayer says a lot about the people who are praying. And despite all the baggage, a sociology of prayer invites us to reflect on what type of community we are, what type of community we want to become, and how we'll get there. Because for me, prayer is an act of faith in the best possible meaning of that word, that we do not have to resign ourselves to the injustices of oppression or humanity to the vacuous pursuit of accumulating money, power, and pleasure, that we do not have to lose ourselves in the resistance to this injustice, but that we can preserve our humanity in the face of it by finding ways to care for the earth, for each other, and for our shared future. And that is the best prayer I can think of or know. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.